you talked about the the band gap, right? So in classes, we've associated band gaps with semiconductors and metals and kind of compared the two. So I was wondering, how does that work with, with quantum dots? How do these principles vary between semiconductor-based and metal-based quantum dots? Sure. So a lot of things change when you make materials small. So not just how much space an excited state can take up, but these surface-to-volume properties also impact other aspects as well. So one of these one of the simple concepts is actually the melting point, that if you take a metal that has a melting point over a thousand degrees, if you make it really small, you can actually lower its melting point mm. down to a few hundred degrees Celsius. So that's a huge impact on it. Um, people have also seen in metal nanocrystals that you can control the plasmon wave function. So the energy at which the electrons oscillate in the system, and that's useful in metal nanocrystals for various sorts of photodynamic or phototherapy applications as well. So it's something really different from how semiconductor quantum dots behave. That's interesting. So what is, so you mentioned for these specific types of therapies, uh, controlling those plasmon energies is important in the metals, but like why exactly does that matter for that application? Like what's, what's that purpose there? Sure. So either for mantle nanocrystals and phototherapies or actually for also semiconductor quantum dots for photodynamic therapy, you need, um, wavelengths that can pass through human tissue to excite these materials. And right. So for example, one of the applications of metal nanocrystals in photodynamic therapy is to have the metal nanocrystal be located near tissue you would like to heat up to damage. So for example, cancerous cells, you could have specific right. tagants on the outsides of these nanocrystals that would link them to this area of a tumor. And then you can have them be excited by a wavelength that's, I guess, human, human tissue would be transparent to those wavelengths. So you could have sort of near IR, near IR light or wavelengths excite the plasmon resonance in these nanocrystals directly um, in very localized areas and heat them up to destroy oh. cancerous cells, for example. Wow. And so, so that process that you just outlined, which is, you know, taking these cells, sort of programming them or, or you know, for lack of better words, to go attack a specific part of the body, heat it, destroy it. Um, you call that photodynamic therapy? Did I hear that correctly? Is that, is that what that process is coined? Yes. Yeah. That's how I've been. That's how I've okay. heard of it. Wow. No, I've never heard of that prior to today. So that's, that's super cool. Okay. Um, first time that's come up on the show. And so uh, glad we were able to, glad we were able to bring that up. Yeah. And I guess you touched on the surface area to volume ratio. And that's something that I've seen is talked a lot about in classes. When we talk about like nanoparticles in general, it seems very, very important so can you talk more about that? Why is that ratio important when we get into the quantum scale or the nanoscale? Sure. The general concept of surface area to volume ratios is just sort of the geometric concept, right? That, that they scale at different orders of magnitude relative to the radius of a sphere. But when you talk about things like metal nanocrystals and those melting points, it's that often you can look at the surface energy versus the interior energy of a material. And suddenly, if you think about really small materials, the surface energy is a large contribution where it used to be a very small effect. So for example, um, different crystal facets have different crystal energies. You would have them grow differently. And those the, the melting point is largely from the surface energy suddenly being such a large contribution to the total system. And uh, just a quick question here. This may not be of any importance, but um, you had mentioned this concept of melting point a few times. Is that a, as a governing principle of any importance to the quantum dot space? Or is that um, in terms of discussing some of these scientific principles, just one of the things that has um, a significant change in contribution as you start to mess with the size of your particles? I think that's more of just a significant change in the contribution. I mean, mostly I focus on inorganic semiconductors and crystalline materials. Right. Um, so then when you start talking about surface energies, um, and growth kinetics, that's when it becomes really important. So okay. um, we want these really small crystalline materials. Their size is really important to their properties, but being able to synthetically control that in the lab um, is really where, I guess, I come in and scientists who work in material science and chemistry on this come in that because every atom is now so important, yeah. we need to be able to build up these crystals in solution with incredible precision and control, right? So we pick particular chemical precursors that can react at very specific chemical rate to right. be able to produce the materials in solution that will then precipitate and grow as crystal. And every aspect of that growth is important. So the rate that it happens at, being able to keep the crystals a particular size, making sure that the defect concentrations are as low as possible and being able to control the size and shape of the final material is really all critical to the final 
performance capabilities that we want. So we want sure. these specific emission wavelengths, but in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to control the chemistry. Right. That's awesome. And so to talk about medical imaging, just to go back to it very briefly, why do we choose quantum dots or why are they an effective application when it comes to this tagging? Is it their ability to link it to specific proteins or parts of the body? Is it the ability to control the emissions or the, the wavelengths, or is it something else entirely? Sure. It's kind of all of the above. Um, okay. So the first <laughs> is that the wavelengths are so tunable and controllable that you can have, um, I guess, multiplexed imaging. You could have different wavelengths and you could have different filter cube sets in your biological imaging and look at one layer and then another. As you mentioned, they can be specifically tagged to particular areas. So Quantum dots are small crystals, but they also have um, organic molecules that you can bind to the outside. And those organic molecules that are bound to the outside typically are used to control the solubility properties. So what sorts of solvents you can put these crystals in, but they can also be specifically linked to particular biological entities or antibodies that can bind to specific locations. So you can use them to direct the location of a quantum dot in a system. So for biological imaging, you can put particular antibodies on that will link them to only certain areas of a cell and you can identify them that way. There's a third property of quantum dots that are kind of interesting compared to other dyes and that's just that they're really good absorbers, particularly if you ever look at two photon absorption. So sometimes in biological systems, it's similarly to what we were talking about with photodynamic therapy. You need the material to absorb light, but it also has to pass through some sort of other medium. So in biological imaging, this is often water or some sort of buffer. Um, so you need to choose excitation wavelength that can pass through that medium without being absorbed and your final tagging will actually see and absorb. So quantum dots are really good at absorbing um, these wavelengths that are transmissible through biological media. 